Welcome to our Wednesday's broadcast of The Gospel Truth. Today I'm nearing the end of my fourth week of teaching on financial stewardship. I've written a book on this. This is a 166-page book. We're asking for a donation of any amount to help us with the expense of this. And then I've gotten a, a little uh, summary, a 50-page summary of this whole teaching. This is our free gift to you. We'll be giving away 60, 70,000 of these, and I encourage people to help us financially. But I, this is such an important issue that I just want you to have it. So if you could not or would not send anything, we'll send you that little booklet as a free gift. We've also got a study guide that's over 300 pages. It's the same material, just reformatted so you can teach other people. Let me just go back and say that this is such an important subject, and there is so much religious uh, resistance to teaching on prosperity. That's the reason I entitled this Financial Stewardship. It's really not about prosperity. It's about stewardship. God is the one who is the source of all prosperity. Deuteronomy 8.18 says, You shall remember it's the Lord your God who gives you power to get wealth that He may establish His covenant. God doesn't give us money. He gives us power and anointing. It was provided by Jesus. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says that, uh, you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, so that you through His poverty might be made rich. Prosperity, I mean, not just barely getting by, but richness, abundance, is part of what Jesus came to provide for us. Uh, but it doesn't come automatically any more than healing comes automatically, than joy comes automatically, relationships, marriage, all of these things. We have to renew our mind and we have to pursue this. And yet there's a religious concept that you just don't ever talk about money, that God will just supernaturally make things appear. You know, let me use an example. I was raised and heard this my whole life about George Mueller, and he had a number of orphanages in England and George Mueller gave testimony about how, I don't know the exact number, but I think it was hundreds of children that were in this orphanage, and they actually sat down and joined hands and were praying and blessing the food which they didn't have. He was had no food for these kids, and he just prayed. And as he was praying, a truck drove up and started unloading food. And they use that as an example of see that if you just trust God and if you'll tell God your needs, uh, it'll just supernaturally happen. And I don't mean to disparage that, but if you continue to study and if you learn about the life of George Mueller, yes, he was trusting God, and yes, it was faith for him to stand there and bless that food that they didn't have, and God did miraculously supply. But what you don't understand is that he also sent out a newsletter. And in this newsletter, he talked about what the needs of that orphanage was and how many kids they had to feed and all of these things. And the person that brought the food, there's no doubt that the timing of it, it was God. I'm not saying it wasn't God, but God used people. And if those people, if there was not people who knew what the need was, he probably wouldn't have seen that supplied. And again, there's some people think, no, God just supernaturally supplies things. God uses people. Luke 6, 38 says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. God is not going to rain money out of the sky. He is not going to just supernaturally counterfeit money and put it in your wallet. God uses people. God doesn't have money. He's not going to counterfeit money. God gives you power and anointing, and He uses people. Did you know in my ministry, I remember when Jim Baker and Jimmy Swagger, both of them in the same year, had major scandals. It was the first time that really, really visible uh, media ministers had uh, been exposed in that degree, or at least in my perspective, in my lifetime. It was the first time. And did you know that, uh, I forget exactly what our income was back then, but our income went down $40,000 a month when those two guys got put on, uh, well, Jim Baker went to jail and Jimmy Swagger got defrocked by the Assembly of God and some things happened. And anyway, it affected my finances. I didn't have anything to do with what they did. And yet, you know what it was? God uses people. 
And when people all of a sudden saw that some of these people on TV were not everything that they were cracked up to be, they immediately became skeptical and they quit giving. Did you know that when 9-11 happened, our income was affected by that? Every time that some major thing happens, like the Iraqi war, or you could just go through and any major thing that just captivates the attention of people, do you know what happens? People quit watching the Christian stations, the Christian networks, they tune in to the secular stations wondering about where is all of this going and out of sight, out of mind because they aren't watching my program and other programs. It affects our income. I don't have anything to do with the Iraqi war. I didn't do anything with these guys that, that you know, stole money or, or did anything else, and yet it affects me. It's simplistic for us to believe that God is just going to supernaturally supply the money. He flows through people. If you aren't in ministry, if you're out working a business, instead of you just praying and saying, oh God, you know, give me some money, you need to recognize God's going to use people. I had a guy that used to be a Baptist pastor. He got hold of the Word of God and got kicked out of his Baptist church. So he came over to where I was in Childress, Texas, and he started attending my church, and he was out of a job as a pastor, and he was living with some other people in the church, and the guy was mooching off of everybody, and we were taking him food, and I was trying to encourage him. And I said, you know, you need to go get a job or something. He says, well, I'm just believing God. And I said, well, why can't you get a job and believe God? Why don't you do something? God said in Deuteronomy chapter 8 that he, or excuse me, Deuteronomy, um, man, 28. Deuteronomy 28, he said he would bless the work of your hands. A hundred times zero is zero. I said, go get a job. And he said, well, before I became a pastor, what I used to do, he worked on cars and he repaired dents and, you know, things like that in cars. And he said, what I used to do is take a business card and I would just go downtown and I'd look at cars. And if there was a scratch, if there was something, you know, a dent in the car, and I'd estimated it was like $200 to fix this, I'd write on the back of the card, I'll fix this dent for $100, half price today, give me a call. And he said, I'd just go downtown and do, a, do that for an hour or so, and I'd have enough work lined up for a month. And I said, well, why don't you do that now? And he said, well, I'm just trusting God. I said, why don't you do that and trust God? See, this concept that God is just going to supply money directly to you is not how it works. God is going to give you a creative idea or you're going to set your hand unto something and you're going to do something for somebody that is worth money to them and they will pay you for it or you will produce some kind of a product that they will consider to be worth more to them than this $10 bill that they have and they'll swap for you. But people are going to be used in your finances. And so I told this guy, I said, why don't you do that? And he did that, and you know what? God started meeting his needs. But we have students every year who come, and they know that God told them to come to Bible school, and so they're trusting God for their finances, but they won't do anything. God is not going to rain money out of heaven. He's not going to counterfeit money. It's going to come through people, and somehow or another, people are going to be involved in your finances. You've got to go out and do something. That is so simple. I just taught a chapel on this to our Bible college students because many of them are just sitting there trusting, they're believing God and doing all that they know to do, but they won't go work a job. You got to work a job. You got to do something. Uh, maybe not everybody works eight to five. Maybe you've got intellectual uh, you know, abilities and stuff that will be worth something to somebody. Maybe you can work on the internet and do something, but somehow or another, you have to do something that will generate and release this flow of finances towards you. You know, in my own personal life and ministry, I know that God isn't going to just drop money out of heaven to me. I know it comes through people. And so, you know what? I minister to potentially 5.2 billion people. Of course, not all of those people watch the program, but that's the potential. There are people that are watching this program. I'm speaking into their life. I'm sharing truths with them that the truth will set them free. And it's appropriate for me to believe for God to supernaturally supply my needs through the people I minister to. It says, uh, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If I've sown to you spiritual things, I'm supposed to reap back financial things from you. So a minister is working. 
He may not be punching a clock and doing manual labor, but I guarantee you it's work to minister the gospel. And so I'm working, and it says over in 1 uh, Timothy chapter 5, let those who labor in the Word be counted worthy of double honor. It calls it laboring in the Word. You know, for every one hour that I teach the Word of God, I have spent hundreds, maybe thousands of hours meditating in Scripture. Over this last weekend, just yesterday, I spent hours studying the Word. I've been doing this for 55 years. And so my point is, I'm not trying to draw attention to myself. I'm trying to give an illustration that there is no such thing as you just believing God and God supplying your needs supernaturally, sovereignly, without some person being involved. People are involved in your prosperity. So if you own a business, instead of just sitting there and praying and waiting for God to do something, take your authority. People are going to buy their product from somebody. And so say, Father, I don't care what the economy is or what, you know, fear is being put out there. They're going to buy somebody's product. I'm just believing that they're coming and getting my product. I send my angels out. I believe that they are touching people from the north, the south, the east, and the west. God, give me creative ideas. Show me if you want me to advertise. Show me if you want me to put a sign up in the window. But you do something and recognize that, yes, God is going to be the one that supplies your needs, but He flows through people. That is so simple. You got to have somebody to help you to misunderstand that. What I want to do in the last three days that I have this week teaching on uh, financial stewardship is to start talking about partnership. And I've made this point earlier in the week, but it's obvious that when you give to a ministry or to a church or, you know, to any kind of missionary work, benevolence work, anything like that, it's obvious how your gift benefits the person you give to. But most people don't realize how it benefits you. So what I want to do is to take the book of Philippians and just take some things, probably scriptures that most of you have heard before, but we haven't heard them in the context that Paul wrote this. Paul was writing to his partners. The Philippians were a unique group of people. Matter of fact, I'll get into this in more detail, not on today's program, but later in the week. But he said over in Philippians chapter 4, he says that the Philippians were the only people that ever supported him after he left a local area. I think that's a terrible thing to say. But most of the people that Paul ministered to, he exposed his life to persecution. He was beaten with rods, beaten with whips. He was put in uh, prison multiple times. He was run out of town. Paul suffered. He, he went to great expense and personal loss to be able to bring the gospel to people. And yet there was only one group of people out of all of the people he ministered to on multiple different countries that ever gave to him after he left the local area. Other people, they might have given him some food. They might have given him lodging. They might have helped him with finances while he was there. But once out of sight, out of mind. The Philippians were different than other people. The Philippians were partners. And let me point this out also, that if you read the 28th chapter of the book of Acts, it talks about Paul being in prison for two whole years in Rome and he was allowed to have his own house that he rented and paid for, but he was under house arrest, but he had his own private re residence that he rented. Now, let me ask you, how does a prisoner pay rent on a house? It's obvious that Paul wasn't working and making money himself. It was his partners. And the Philippians were the only people, he said, who had ever supported him when he left the local area. So it's possible that somebody else might have been involved, but as far as we know, it was probably the Philippians. And he even mentions that in the fourth chapter that they had sent again to help him while he was in prison in Rome. This book was written from his Roman imprisonment, and he was thanking them for what they had done. And they are probably the ones that were paying for this house. So I say all of that to say that Paul was writing to partners and some of the blessings that are put here in the book of Philippians, we take them and we just apply them to everybody, but really they don't apply to everybody. They apply to people who are partners. 
I JUST IN THE FIRST COUPLE OF DAYS OF THIS WEEK WAS TALKING ABOUT THE QUEEN OF SHEBA AND HOW THAT SHE USED HER GIFT TO REACH OUT AND GRAB HOLD OF THE BLESSING AND THE ANOINTING THAT WAS ON SOLOMON'S LIFE AND BRING IT INTO HER LIFE, THAT HER GIFT MADE ROOM FOR HER AND BROUGHT HER BEFORE GREAT MAN, PROVERBS 18, 16. WELL, IN A SENSE, THAT'S WHAT THESE PHILIPPIANS WERE DOING. THESE PHILIPPIANS, BY SUPPORTING THE APOSTLE PAUL AND HELPING HIM EVEN DURING HIS IMPRISONMENT, THEY WERE BECOMING A PARTAKER WITH HIM. AND THE BLESSING AND THE ANOINTING THAT WAS ON HIS LIFE WAS ALSO BEING POURED OUT TO THEM. EVEN THOUGH THEY WERE SEPARATED BY HUNDREDS OR THOUSANDS OF MILES, IN THE SPIRIT REALM, THEY BECAME A PARTNER AND THE ANOINTING, THE BLESSING OF GOD THAT WAS ON PAUL'S LIFE BEGAN TO WORK IN THEM. SO LET ME JUST SHOW YOU THIS OUT OF THE BOOK OF PHILIPPIANS. IN PHILIPPIANS CHAPTER 1, VERSE 1, IT SAYS, PAUL AND Timotheus, THE SERVANTS OF JESUS CHRIST, TO ALL THE SAINTS IN CHRIST JESUS WHICH ARE IN PHILIPPI WITH THE BISHOPS AND DEACONS, GRACE BE UNTO YOU IN PEACE FROM GOD OUR FATHER AND FROM THE LORD JESUS CHRIST. I THANK MY GOD UPON EVERY REMEMBRANCE OF YOU. AGAIN, IF YOU'RE PAYING ATTENTION, THIS RIGHT HERE, IN JUST THE THIRD VERSE BEGINS TO SHOW YOU THAT THIS WAS A SPECIAL GROUP OF PEOPLE BECAUSE PAUL THANKED GOD EVERY TIME HE THOUGHT OF THEM. YOU KNOW, I'VE SPENT ABOUT 40 YEARS TRAVELING AND MINISTERING, AND I'VE BEEN IN, I DON'T KNOW, 40-SOMETHING COUNTRIES. I'VE BEEN ALL OVER THE WORLD. I'VE MINISTERED ALL OVER THE UNITED STATES. AND THERE ARE SOME PEOPLE THAT I THANK GOD EVERY TIME I THINK OF THEM. THERE'S OTHER PEOPLE THAT I TRY NOT TO THINK OF THEM <laughs> AND I'M NOT SAYING THAT IN A BAD WAY, BUT MAN, IT HADN'T BEEN A GOOD EXPERIENCE AND IT'S NOT A GOOD FEELING WHEN I THINK ABOUT THEM. SO WHEN I READ THIS, THAT HE SAYS, I THANK GOD UPON EVERY REMEMBRANCE OF YOU. THERE WAS A SPECIAL RELATIONSHIP BETWEEN PAUL AND THESE PHILIPPIANS. AND HE GOES ON TO SAY, ALWAYS IN EVERY PRAYER OF MINE FOR YOU ALL MAKING REQUEST WITH JOY. AGAIN, THIS JUST INCREASES THE VALUE HE PLACES ON THE PHILIPPIANS BECAUSE HE SAYS, IN EVERY PRAYER, OF HIS, HE THANKS GOD FOR THESE PHILIPPIANS. YOU KNOW, PAUL PRAYED A LOT, AND TO THINK THAT EVERY TIME HE PRAYED, HE ALWAYS WAS THANKING GOD FOR THE PHILIPPIANS. THIS PUTS A SPECIAL RELATIONSHIP BETWEEN HIM AND THESE PHILIPPIANS. AND THEN IN THE FIFTH VERSE, HE SAYS, HE WAS THANKING GOD FOR THEIR FELLOWSHIP IN THE GOSPEL FROM THE FIRST DAY UNTIL NOW. DID YOU KNOW THE WORD IN GREEK THAT WAS TRANSLATED FELLOWSHIP HERE IN THE ENGLISH, THAT WORD IS KOINONIA, AND THAT WORD LITERALLY MEANS PARTNERSHIP. PAUL IS SAYING THAT THESE PEOPLE WERE SPECIAL TO HIM. EVERY TIME HE PRAYED, HE THOUGHT ABOUT THEM AND PRAISED GOD FOR THEM FOR THEIR PARTNERSHIP, THEIR FELLOWSHIP IN THE GOSPEL. AND AGAIN, THOSE VERSES THAT I'VE ALREADY MENTIONED, WE'LL GET INTO MORE DETAIL OVER IN THE FOURTH CHAPTER. THESE ARE THE ONLY PEOPLE WHO EVER SUPPORTED HIM AFTER LEAVING A LOCAL AREA, AND PROBABLY THEY WERE THE ONES WHO WERE PAYING HIS RENT FOR HIS IMPRISONMENT IN ROME. THESE PEOPLE WERE PARTNERS WITH PAUL. AND SO THE ENTIRE BOOK OF PHILIPPIANS IS WRITTEN TO PARTNERS. AND I'M NOT GOING TO HAVE TIME TO GET INTO ALL OF THESE DETAILS ON TODAY'S PROGRAM, BUT LET ME JUST SAY THIS, AND THEN ON TOMORROW AND THE NEXT DAY'S PROGRAM, I'LL BE VERIFYING THIS WITH SCRIPTURE. BUT THERE ARE, partner, there are PROMISES THAT APPLY TO PARTNERS THAT DON'T APPLY TO OTHER PEOPLE IN THE BODY OF CHRIST. THAT'S NOT TO SAY THAT GOD DOESN'T LOVE ALL OF THE MEMBERS OF THE BODY OF CHRIST. HE LOVES EVERY ONE OF US BY GRACE, NOT BASED ON PERFORMANCE. SO GOD LOVES ALL OF US. GOD WANTS TO PROSPER EVERY ONE OF US, BUT HE CAN'T. YOU HAVE TO COOPERATE WITH GOD. DID YOU KNOW THE SCRIPTURE MAKES IT VERY CLEAR IN 2 PETER CHAPTER 3, VERSE 9, IT SAYS, GOD IS NOT WILLING THAT ANY SHOULD PERISH, BUT THAT ALL SHOULD COME TO REPENTANCE. SO IT'S GOD'S WILL THAT EVERY SINGLE PERSON BE SAVED. BUT NOT EVERY PERSON IS SAVED, AND NOT EVERY PERSON IS GOING TO BE SAVED, EVEN THOUGH THAT'S GOD'S WILL, BECAUSE YOU HAVE TO BELIEVE TO RECEIVE. IF YOU DOUBT, YOU DO WITHOUT. AND THERE ARE A LOT OF PEOPLE THAT JUST HAVE PUSHED GOD TO THE SIDE. THEY'RE TOO BUSY SERVING themselves AND DOING THEIR OWN THING. AND THERE'S PEOPLE THAT ARE GOING TO SPLIT HELL WIDE OPEN, NOT BECAUSE GOD WILLED IT, BUT BECAUSE YOU HAVE TO BELIEVE TO RECEIVE. IT'S THE SAME THING WITH PROSPERITY. IT'S THE SAME THING WITH the ble ALL OF THE BLESSINGS OF GOD. GOD WANTS TO BLESS EVERY ONE OF US. IF IT WAS ONLY UP TO THE LORD, EVERY SINGLE BORN AGAIN BELIEF... WELL, FIRST OF ALL, EVERY PERSON WOULD BE BORN AGAIN, WHICH THEY AREN'T BECAUSE THEY HAVE A CHOICE. HE DOESN'T FORCE US. BUT ONCE YOU GET BORN AGAIN, IF IT WAS ONLY UP TO GOD, 
every one of us would be healed and delivered and prosperous and operating in fullness of joy and on and on it goes. And yet not all Christians are like that. I could even say that probably very few Christians are walking in the abundance that God has for us, not because God doesn't will it, but because we have to cooperate and we let the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, other things choke the Word of God. We let the fear and the unbelief of this world get on the inside of us and it stops the flow. It's not God's fault. So likewise, the things that I'm going to be pointing out here in the book of Philippians, promises that probably most people have tried to take and apply to yourself. They don't apply to you if you aren't partnering in the gospel. And I know that that may be offensive, but if you study the book of Philippians, this was written to his partners. For He was praising God for their partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. This is written to partners. That promise about God's going to complete the good work He's begun in you, that was to partners. The promise about that God will supply all of your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus, that's to partners. The promise that I can do all things through Christ, that was a promise to His partners. So we need to recognize that even though God is good and wants to do good in every person's life, it doesn't automatically come to pass. We've got to learn to receive and partnership is an important part of you receiving. I've said this before, but partnership, it's obvious how it blesses the church, the ministry, the missionary that you give to, but it's not so obvious how it blesses you. The book of Philippians was written to partners and you can take the things that were said here and apply them to you if you've gone beyond just giving every once in a while, but if you start partnering on a regular basis, if you become a supporter of the gospel, that moves you to a whole new level and it opens up brand new things from God that you've not had before. I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel and the programs that we have available. And I want to encourage you that you can get the materials that we've offered. Also, I'd like to encourage you to like our program and subscribe to what we're doing. We have a lot of material and I believe it'll be a real blessing to you. So thank you for being a part of it. God bless you.